The old question, what to paint? I borrow liberally from reality. I paint personal stories. My goal is a premise on locating a shared emotional truth. If I feel it, other people will feel it too. One of the challenges I've had in my art making over the years is staying engaged. I'm always curious to meet artists who have consistently stayed in it and motivated. How do we stay as excited about the thousandth piece of art as the first? Gary Riddell is a painter who's had many transitions in his successful career. He worked as a realistic illustrator covering many genres. Later he shifted into fine art paintings. Today we'll be talking about these most recent oil paintings. They walk the line of figurative realism as well as abstraction. It's about surface, paint, but also the depth of the human experience. It's bold but delicate. They're metaphorical. He's made thousands of images in his long career. What's especially amazing to me about Gary is his level of enthusiasm. It's always high. We're going to find out how he has maintained this, lessons he has learned along the way, as well as a look at his incredibly consistent art practice. Gary's paintings are represented by Dolby Chadwick Gallery in San Francisco and Gallery Hennock in New York City. The images we talk about sitting in the studio this afternoon are shown on the Art to Life website under podcasts in this week's episode. So as you're listening or afterwards, have a look at his work. This was one of the first in-person conversations I've had since the pandemic began. Going to Gary's studio, sitting amongst the oil paint and brushes, half-starred paintings and piles of sketchbooks, and all things Gary Riddell was a privilege. Gary's joy of life, living, and art making is contagious. Join me now as I am just walking to Gary's studio in Terra Linda, California. Welcome to Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. I just walked into Gary's studio. It's so cool to be in an actual person's studio with another human being. I've been on Zoom calls forever. Gary, it's, this is so great to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, for letting me have a chance to talk. And, and the smell of oil paint and standing and looking at all these paintings. So, I mean, I know that some of the folks listening might not know your work, but... Give us a little, just real quick background. I mean, you you know, just the quick and dirty. Oh, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I've been doing this my whole life since I was a child. It's all I've been doing. Uh, went to, I have a formal education in it. And while I graduated, I veered towards illustration and became a very prominent illustrator. It's, For like books mostly, uh, right? I did movie, record, advertising and books. I did, uh, I was in the magazines. I was in the heyday of all of it. I was looking at those, that work. And I got to say, I mean, you know how to paint. I mean, it's so realistic, but yeah. it's, it's twisted. And it's like, you can do monsters. You can do cowboys. You can do women. You can do sexy people. You can do dirty people. You can do vagrants. I mean, you just, you had the chops. I mean, well, it's just crazy. I, like I, you could do, it seems like anybody could ask you to do anything and you could paint it. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's very true. Um, I mean, I, and realistically, realistically, that's what just blows me I'm, away. I'm a lot like a studio musician that could play any kind of music. And I, and I was trained, I was like a soldier. I would go in and do that. I think that the interesting thing about the whole aspect of commercial illustration versus fine art it comes down to point of view and that's one of the things that i did as a young man i was constantly trying to sort out what it is that i wanted to make and i think it's the problem of all artists we all sit there and scratch our head what in the world do you want to paint do you want to paint a tree do you want to paint my neighbor do i want to paint <laughs> aunt louise or should i just uh, read a silly comic book and come up with images with that it's all good but the at the end of the day you have to come to grips with who you are and what you want to do with this. And it, what's hard, it was hard for me, and I kind of 
I can imagine. I mean, you had this crazy skill set. Anybody could ask you to do anything and you could do it. Therefore, postponing the time when you start to think, you know what? I don't actually want to do Western bar scenes, but right. you're successful at it. Right. I mean, right. you're crazy successful right. at it. Those, right. those right. early things, and I'm going to include some on the Art to Life podcast section so you guys go check it out. I mean, it's next level. The way you can, you just know how to paint. I mean, it's just amazing. But how long did it take? Like, at what point was there a turning point? Because that's what's so interesting to me is when do you, how do you start figuring out what it is that you want to yeah, paint? Yeah, right? Very early on. Really? Very early on. And it was frustrating because the education that I had was formal. In other words, it was traditional drawing. I would say, if anything, I'm a self-taught painter. I did a lot of drawing. And then when commercially, when I started, I was working for uh, magazines like Rolling Stone or anything that didn't have a lot of money at that time and they wanted to print my drawings and that was sort of like the beginning mm. of my personal success and then I started going to art museums and that was a disease because if you go to an art museum that leads you to sc scratching your head saying well, my God, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, we, how much time do we have? We gotta, we gotta ask some new questions. And I think that's it. I was very inquisitive, always asked questions, and kept trying to broaden my vocabulary. And it was with that. How about this? Here I am. I'm trying to be a struggling illustrator. <laughs> and I turn around and I and I said, you know what? I have to learn painting, oil painting. So I started to do all my illustrations in oil paint. And art directors at one point would just go crazy. As one would say, we're not asking you to paint the Mona Lisa, dude. <laughs> we're asking you to paint an illustration. Right. What are you bringing this crap in there? Because you were you were exiting. You were, you were I, starting to paint the Mona Lisa yeah, or wanting I, to. Right. And I didn't really know where I wanted to go with it. So I did all kinds of things. And I, and I think that that was interesting is that illustration gives you an opportunity, at least for me, to paint a wide variety of things. And at the end of the day, I said, well, maybe I don't want to do dinosaurs or cowboys or whatever. I think I'm looking at light. I'm looking at why, you know, Claude Monet was doing these haystacks, the subtlety, the quietness. And so there was the beginning of the, the idea that along with my commercial work, I started to side by side do my own painting. And, you know, after a number of years, I also realized as I went along that I wasn't alone with that. Andy Warhol, Rosenquist, yeah. yeah. So many of the of the painters had backgrounds as being an illustrator. Edward Hopper, you know, Wayne Tebow. Right, uh, right, yeah, right. Everybody has had... It's like, it's this field that allows you to kind of like tread water for a while, get money and kind of survive. Yes. Yeah. But it is challenging. It was for me, and I think yeah. it's for a lot of people... It's just hard when you're busy doing all these different kinds of things. And that's what's so curious to me is, you know, I know what turned the corner for me, but was there a project that you hated in particular or one that you love so much? You said, ah, I'm going to do more of this and I'm going to turn down these projects and I'm going to, you well, know. Well, that's interesting. Because you your work's figurative. Yeah. It's abstract, but it's, it's representational. It's amorphous. It's all kinds of things. It's emotional. It's metaphorical, really, but I mean, what? This is so different than what you were making then, and I'm oh, just yeah, curious what yeah. what Night started Night you on this. Like, what was there a project, uh, or was it just slow? Not, not particularly. It was just, it was a slow burn. It was a real mm. slow burn. And then what happened was is that in in some ways, when people. I, my friends would make a, a vast amount of money from doing something commercial. I say my illustration friends, and they would go off to Europe. I would take the money and buy blocks of time when I didn't have to do illustration. And that was the beginning. So I, there's 10 years there between, say, 19. 
89 all the way up you know it's going through all the 90s and i'm entering shows with my own work i'm going to museum shows universities and so forth and i'm getting into all kinds of shows and i'm beginning a dialogue with other artists but i think that most importantly i'm bringing beginning a dialogue with myself with my own visuals and and are starting to become happy with my own skin Mm. because a lot of people especially when they're searching about to making art they're not happy with themselves and they go in different directions and you have to sort of just become happy with who you are and but it was that did you get happy because you just narrowed this down or were you happy because i mean that's calming right that you you get to kind of you're just dropping into something but i mean just curious how do you is it is it you'd like the results you were getting obviously yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i was be- beginning to have a a relationship with the visuals that i identified with as who i was mm. you know and, and and was happy to have the fact that and i suggest this all the time to younger artists enter shows and a lot of times our other artists will say well geez louise gary we don't want to enter shows because they could say no and, and because I was an illustrator, I was used to hearing no, yeah. or could you change that? Right, could you do right. this? You know, I mean, yeah. when you're an illustrator, like a, a musician in an orchestra, you have to be able to have a hard exterior shell. Yeah. And you have to be able to realize that, okay, this is a job. I'll figure it out. It's a process. Yeah, and get used to that. There's a certain humility to like, oh, they didn't like it and I'll change it. Even though I think they're wrong, I'll change it anyway. You just kind of get over yourself. And I think it does create a a good attitude for then going out into the world and not giving a shit whether someone likes something or not. says so much, you know? Yes, Like I've had that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all had, you know, where people go, no, I don't think so. I've got horror stories with that. And you just sort of just go, fine fine i will move forward yeah and um yeah we'll have another moment in time we'll talk about this and then you see it in print and then you 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 get an idea about what their perspective was and you go well that's great but that's not really what i want to do as a person Mm. you know i would have done it differently you know and i think that uh that's why i started doing my own work i just want to do things differently and yeah you know i was it was thinking when i was looking at what you were making before and i forgot how freaking amazing the illustrations you were doing all those book covers and everything oh, yeah. and all the information in them and then i'm looking at what you're making now or or that whole migration into a, a and it seems to me and i see this a lot like you've narrowed down a little bit we're, we've hey, gone 39 years ago yes oh my god so i'm looking at you guys ago. At, at a he handed me a postcard of a santa with a beer and an uh, electric punk, guitar punk, punk santa punk claus. santa claus but yeah but here's what yeah, I think so is so... a big contrast between what like, we got. Is, is this... What I see is that we go from things like this, like tons of stuff, and then we synthesize and it becomes more personal, but usually it gets... It becomes more simpler in a way. And I just see that all the time. Yeah, you know, you, it's not you, like you, you would do this up, in the uh, reverse order. You're not going to go from this work into, a, into showing all these things. I mean, one could. I'm just wondering why why that happens like you let go of 90 percent of what you were doing and you ended up here and and i just think that's sort of fascinating that when we go inside it gets quieter and simpler and it's more clear and right that, that's right. your work right. it's right. like it's right. really right. getting right right and it's I just, getting more simplified yeah 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 I'm and it's, go. but it's bigger at the same time even though there's less stuff in it yeah it feels bigger like it's it's more universal. Well, thank you. Don't I, you think? Uh, yeah, I, I love this. You, yeah. you can represent me. Okay, <laughs> I buy all that. No, I, absolutely. You, I mean, these yeah. are these are. It's a bigger space, even though there's less stuff in it. Right, right, and part of that can be the fact that when I was very young and I started to go to uh, museums and galleries and stuff, I realized that art wasn't just a five by seven image on a book rack or an eight by 11 magazine cover that it could be eight by 10 feet or six feet by eight feet. And you were creating an environment in which people could 
take this work into their space. It was just a, an evaluation about how you address, you know, the the visual. You how know, you like, want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and it's funny, but I try to I try to convey that to students when I'm I'm speaking to them about their work and looking at the and, and then just the opposite could be said about I could think of someone in my life who uh, makes big pieces of art and I'm saying, well, you know, that's nice. You make them eight feet by eight feet. But where are they going? You know, I mean, not everybody can fit them in. Yeah, yeah I can fit them through the doorway, you know, and you have to sort of come to grips with something that's rather comfortable for you and how you want to see it. And I've laid out my studio in a set that I sit down on this couch and I'll be 10 feet, 20 feet from a painting and I look at it from this distance and I try to look at it just as I would a book cover. But it's different. I'm controlling it. Yeah, well, I love the idea that we look at these pictures and I sort of evaluate it. I mean, I can totally see how you would do it. But when I look at my work, it's like a book cover sort of because there's is does this what's inside, you know, like some pictures make you want to go in it more. Right. And when they're not working so well, it's just kind of flat and it's like you would just pass it. And your work, there's mystery in it, kind of, you know, like we don't, they're they're like these memory pictures that, you you know, like, you don't 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 know. I don't spell out everything, but I do like to think that they're they're marks on the cave wall as I'm passing through time, because how much more time do I have And I feel that it's important to address things that are bothering me sociopolitically. I also address things that are beautiful and have nothing to do with sociopolitical ideas. But I also think it's important that I sort of wrestle with things that are bothering me about society. And and in the blue image there, I have an image of all these books on the floor. And I'm I love books and I love printed material, but I think that books are being subsidized by, well, iPads. You know, so much uh, electronic media is taking the place of a book. And so I painted a, a young girl, a Chinese girl or an Asian girl reading a book and she has a light being placed upon her. And the books are in the shadow. And just behind her is a shovel. And then on the right, I painted a young boy, a young lad with a yo-yo. And the yo-yo symbolizes technology and how that we're Uh. so obsessed with technology. We're not really seeing things for what they are. And there's the shovel in the background looming very quietly sort of like the death of printed material and we may see that you know kindle will take over amazon is is printing more and more electronic books and i really have friends who are interested in the printed page setting type making the book looking at the weight of the paper all of that yes i think is an art form that's sort of just leaving us and so i thought well it's 2021 and uh, I wrote at the bottom of the of the painting there and little type there. If you get really oh, close, yeah. it says uh, curl up. I can't read it from over there. You can re- uh, read. Don't you put some love it, into curling up with oh, a phone? Oh, oh, don't you love curling? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this what I think is kind of cool about this painting. You know, it it feels like like they've unearthed a cellar, you know, and this it looks like that child is looking at a book for the first time. almost. Yeah. Like, whoa, like this is different. What is this? All yeah. this old, yeah. you know, old stuff like you'd find in the bottom of a hole somewhere, you know. But I love how your pictures, there's implied meaning, but it's not everyone's going to get it. But we get the fact that there's something bigger going on than what we're looking at here. You know, it's this is not a portrait of a child reading. This is a bigger idea. And, right. and that's, that's and, and, and all your work has that. Yeah. And I'm using children as a visual metaphor for adults. And I thought that, you know, I do it all the time. And, and I go back and forth. The painting behind you of the African-American boy and the girl studying 
I titled that Watch and Learn. And it just comes from the fact that I grew up with racial hatred and I saw in discrimination going on constantly in my life. And I still see it all the time. And I think that, you know, there should be a time and place where we have to realize that we have to work together. And it's just a little moment of seeing something that my parents or I as a child was to see an African-American in a classroom with white kids was not good. And I grew up on the peninsula, Palo Alto area. There's East Palo Alto. We put African-Americans across the freeway. My parents were forbidden to sell their home to African-Americans. They had to write that on the deed. No. Oh, isn't that awful? On you had, it was, it was oh, a condition. Oh, yes, in the 50s. You wow. would have to sign, if you wanted to live in Palo Alto, you had to sign off that you weren't going to sell this to an African-American. And so they took the African-Americans and they put them over in East Palo Alto. So you have this neighborhood of African-Americans. Diversity. I mean, I think that the interesting thing about the United States is we had Donald Trump who was trying to divide the country. And the United States, I hate to say it, it's a whole world of diversification. That's what's beautiful about this country is that we're all from someplace. And damn it all, we have to get together and realize what a wonderful thing that is. It's so cool that you bring those ideas in. I hadn't seen this piece, but you're, you're actually like bringing these social ideas in. Is that new? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 I've been doing it for a long time. I did a painting up there on the uh, back wall there. And a matter of fact, uh, one of my sons, uh, who's Los Angeles, who was from LA, uh, Zach, he uh, was telling me about, you know, photo images of, uh, I stuck one up there of a, of a German soldier there shooting a uh, woman and a child. And uh, I don't know where he's, where we, we, we were talking about something like that. But that painting there is a gentleman and there's children around him. And uh, I, he has an AR-15 and at the end of the picture there, you have a woman with a, on an ironing board. And I put a deer head on top of her because obviously the National Rifle Association would say, oh, we're not going to use uh, automatic weapons to kill people. We're going to use them to kill deer, all right? And uh, I think I did that painting years ago. And yet we're still... Mass shootings. Yeah, it's just and this recent one. Yeah, yeah, just insane. Why? Why are we doing that? Yeah. All right, folks. I say I, maybe this could be another painting. You can have all the guns in the world, but you can't have bullets. <laughs> <laughs> no bullets allowed because you can't. You're not responsible with bullets. I don't know what is it with the world. You know. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, maybe it's my uh, Berkeley liberal attitude. You know, I have to just do a mark on the wall. Not everybody wants to see this. And when this painting was exhibited in San Francisco, this uh, we had a, a full capacity opening. And there was an individual that came into the gallery who was outspoken. Spoken that he was so dead set against this image. Really? And, and, and because there's the guns in yeah. it and there's kids. and Yeah, yeah. Well, and what are you saying about the individual holding this gun uh, and, and claiming that this gun is going to uh, shoot uh, a woman who has a deer head on her head? Right. You right. know, and I got the storm. I, th- I think that things, nothing's changed. Nothing's did, changed. Did the, so the, obviously the painting's still here. It didn't sell. You, had, you got it back. Uh, Yes, you know, it's interesting. That painting didn't sell, but that was fine because I've got that painting I didn't want to sell. And it was something that a lot of people wanted in shows and to exhibit. And rather, now this is interesting to share with you. When you produce work that you have a connection with and that has a moment where it actually has content and you want it to speak to other people... A lot of times when you sell work, it goes into a vacuum into a private collector's home and no one will see it except that collector. Right. No, it goes. Yeah. I was talking to a friend about this. It's just kind of depressing. Yeah. Um, You know, he works on his paintings take months 
and he's just saying it's just killing me. They just they're you know they are their galleries actually already sold it, and so it it gets taken from his studio and it gets put in someone's house, and that's it's that's gone. the end of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I always say that when, when these are up here in the room, they're up there for a short time and then they're gone, and then they never come back. They're just gone. They're just disip- I don't know. They go into the vortex of the art world. So that's it. Hasta la vista, pal. Go make some more. But, but, I do. <laughs> but a controversial piece, what you're saying is a controversial piece, kind of doesn't get consumed as quickly, maybe floats around longer. Right, right, right. Well, that's exactly it. And so I mix it up with pieces that are controversial. And then yet I, I, I will do work that is not of that, that is pure beauty, pure light, pure things that I find in in a utopian sense of the word, you know, easy to live with it. I enjoy looking at waking up in the morning and, and seeing those images. I don't have images that uh, I, I'm not Francis Bacon, folks. Mm-hmm. And, and right. oh, you know, there's there's a but lot. That's not you. That's not. You yeah. That yeah. That's hand. not me. You know, right. I mean, I think I work things out in myself that need to be said. And then I'm when I feel good about it. I move on. You know, I I did one here. I I find the uh, the uh, gray one of the lady. That's really for me abstract on how I did the 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 paper falling and she's sweeping up white paper and that gray background. And I could see doing that's a small painting. I could see that doing that painting really large and getting into all the color and the surface. I'd like to do a multiple layered color uh palette and then and and they just let little pieces of color come so through. it's almost like an abstraction yeah uh, and then also a realism and that's what's cool about your work i think is that it it's just on that line you know there's realism and then it's you're losing edges and then it's abstracted and it's flat and then it's dimensional are you thinking about that? Oh, <laughs> all, yeah. all, all the okay, time. Okay. And, and then I will go off and do things of, of tangent because I love Bay Area of figurative painters. And so I will go pick up and look at them. And then all of a sudden I'm emulating their style like David Park over there. Uh, David yeah. Park was coming out of me. And I just said, hey, I just really love how he just has so much freedom I know a number of figurative painters who emulate his style. And I just said, you know what? I I gotta turn that I gotta go play those those notes. Oh interesting. So so you're like, I'm gonna do a David Park today. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, why not? Why not? I don't know why not. Oh yeah, because like it's playing music. You know, you just go play music. You know, it's like you you're gonna go do some jazz, you're gonna do some Miles Davis, or I'm gonna go do some uh, classical music, or I'm gonna go I think that time is short and you have to indulge. Yeah, no, that's awesome. You know, I, I, I encourage that all the time. Dealers don't like that, but that, that's fine. Yeah, and you're, this is for you anyway. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I really don't care. And the, and the uh, top little one there, I was noticing, I love Bonard, and he had a bunch of photographs of black and whites of women in bathtubs, and he did some paintings of, of that. And I just said, I'd love to do a a Bonard. And so I took one of his photos as a reference material and and did that exact same thing just for an educational moment. And I walked away and I went, man, I really love this guy. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like we have to just stay a student, you know, and just keep it's like going back to school. Thank you. I think that that's exactly it. As we get older, I'm 70 and yeah, I'm 70 years old. And in, in this time, I'll say that I run into a lot of people who get up in years, in their 60s, and I hear this all the time. Oh, I can't do that because I'm too old. I can't learn guitar. I can't learn to paint. I can't learn. You can. Life isn't over. We're still the same people we are. Yes, we don't move as fast, but you know, you just got to take each day as it is and do what you can and, and realize that as soon as you stop learning, 
that's when you sort of stagnate and you die. Mm. You have to keep the inquisitive self going all the time and challenge yourself. So you come in, you're, you're in the studio, do you, is it like nine to three every day? Or do you have a, how do you set up yeah, your you know, structure this? Oh, okay, structure of the studio. You know, there's all kinds of Well, I mean, because you're doing it successfully, like you're staying engaged, you're fired up, you're as excited as, last time I talked to you, five, ten years ago, yeah. you're exactly the same. So how you're doing this, it's working. And yeah, it's, you're, and you're, it's, you're it's a excited. Yeah, yeah it's, so a what, real, it's a religion. I don't know, you know, it might be what you're drinking. It might be, you know. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> you're not ins- drinking. No, no, it's okay. not drinking. Okay. It's called insanity. Uh-huh. I think that if there's anything about it is, is that the love you make on the canvas is what the canvas will get back to you. It's a love oh, affair. Oh, it's a, it's a awesome. relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's You can't deny that. That you don't love what you do. You do. This is my... Well, sometimes. For a while. I mean, it's rocky. <laughs> Some days. Yeah. Yeah. This is my temple. This The studio is my temple. I am like a priest. I am like a Buddhist who comes every day. It's a practice. I work. My children hate this. My wife hates this. But I work six days a week. I work from 11 to 4. Or f- I, I don't need to work that many hours actually applying paint but it's usually you know 11 to 4 or 10 to 4 or whatever i spend a certain amount of time at different periods of time during the year before i paint working on my sketchbook my sketchbook is very important i in my sketchbook i write down i make images for myself i write down poetry i write down things that interest me uh um, like what does that page say right there oh this is interesting the old question what to paint i borrow liberally from reality i paint personal stories my goal is a premise on locating a shared emotional truth if i feel it other people will feel it too Dude, that's amazing. That's that's you know, that's uh, like a great synopsis of what I think you're doing with your work. Wow. Yeah, and then I, I write things about being a parent. You try as a parent, you love beyond reason, you fight beyond endurance, you hope beyond despair, you never think until the very last moment that it still may not be enough. The trick is learning to love your kids even when they disappoint you. Yeah. This is like part of it. This is like you getting grounded in you, this time in this book and your thoughts. Right. And then my relationship with my wife and doing images. And then this is a poem that came out of the New Yorker. Two pairs of underwear, one white, the other pink, flew up and down on the laundry line, telling the whole world they are madly in love. Nula, Sunday afternoon. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. You know, yes. and then I then I went and I painted her shoes. So you sort of riffing off of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. So so when I get to a point that I want to come up with an idea for a painting, I look at my sketchbook. Uh, I see. And I've been doing sketchbooks for years. And I just make them as personal diaries. And I feel that, you know, that... It's, it's what leads you to... To, to make images. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then everything. you get a sense of one of those. And then you just... When you start on these, are you... Uh, you have a loose idea, or is it like you you see? Is, are these images in these books? Or? Yes, yes. Matter of fact, I have a image there of that painting that I'm looking at, the blue one. Let's see if I can find it here. That's such a great practice to just be in this in this book and then writing. And I didn't sort of realize it. Was, I think it's it's, words for you, too. You know, yeah, I think I think that it's important to write stuff down and then you see it. It's just trying to it's like another form of the yes, of the visual. Yes, yes. It's constantly reinforcing what you're doing. So, yeah, so that was that the blue painting. There was a little drawing. I, I got up 
I drew that. Uh, this drawing and I said, of a, I, a I, little kid with a yo-yo. Yo-yo. And then I came over here and I said, oh, this is, I saw this. And oh, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I said, I, I came in into the studio early and I just drew that and painted it. And I said, okay, another moment in time, I'm going to make that. And so that's where that came from. Now, I know that that sort of goes in the face of my friends who are painters who would say that, but you're not letting anything, not letting improvisation and uh, the subconscious take over from your idea of making visuals. You're you're sort of well, like they're, they're those, originating, they're starting in that place, but yeah, it, you're just you know, translating them from this uh, other place. How about this? I'm still an illustrator. Uh-huh. You know, I I you, which you is know, completely valid. Like it's just what you're thinking about, and now I, now I've got a project. I'm going to take this idea and I'm going to do it. Like, I mean, it's not, yeah. you know, we're all illustrating. We're all illustrating what we're feeling, what we, I mean, I don't have a, a friggin' any clue when I start my work now. I have no right. idea, but I see it in the thing. At a certain point, I start figuring it out or seeing a color combination and I just go down that rabbit hole and then I'm illustrating the thing that I just found, you right. know, but I'm, I'm definitely going with the momentum and and it almost makes itself a little bit but it's no different it is no different yeah uh, you know i and i can't deny my past as someone said your school has been the school of a mechanical way of making art you have been a designer and illustrator and i went there knowing full well the structure of that and how that would change me. and what was the school that you went to? i went i went to california college of arts and crafts oh, okay. or california college of the arts right and in uh, berkeley Oakland, yeah, california. Oakland, Oakland, yeah california yeah and i think it's it's now in san francisco i think that you know it's that's who i am you know like andy warhol would say well that's who i that's yeah. not who i be let's you know the uh zebra cannot change those stripes right so right. so you, you know i think that we have to be happy with just those elements that comprise us as people rather than trying to change who we are go with who we are and be happy with all our crazy quirkiness because that's that's the fingerprint of who we are as yeah, people right. and i think that sometimes art schools in my education going to this college they wanted you to all how about this uh, a drawing class and they wanted everyone to draw the figure the same way well that was fine that's very french Mm. 19th well, it's an century exercise. Ideas. You get the muscles right or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, in the long run, just be who you are. If you see the figure a certain way, then be happy with that. And I was always, when I would come and teach a class, I would want kids just to be who they are. I could help them mechanically be better right, if that's what right. they wanted. And I have that choice because i had that background yeah yeah I'm, well I'm, yeah you know you know how to draw and paint and all yeah that, really. yeah i'd be yeah. like the music i'm the studio musician who can play all the keys uh-huh. but you know it's you know maybe it's not always you know to my advantage to be that skilled because i think that people who have too much skill becomes a distraction from their voice yes yes yeah no i totally get that you know what do you think of this idea this is something i've been thinking a lot about and that as you get your you figure it out and and you start getting kind of like focusing down as you have been the last 20 years but it becomes more personal, but then it becomes at the same time more universal. Yes. And, and I think that's where the success starts happening, that for some reason, there's something that happens when you get more clear about your quirkiness or whatever you want to yeah. call it, that it makes work that's bigger because it's more narrow and more people can can enter it somehow. Right. And, and I think there's some there's success. I mean, like gallery success like selling work more people can identify with it i mean someone's going to buy your work they might not share your view of the book thing but there's a lot of ways that we can experience this picture you right here right right. as opposed to your book covers or things that were more just specific specific and and i think that's i mean that is your work is so metaphorical and i love that i can 
you know, I see myself in some of these little kids, but I mean, I, I'm not seeing, you know, this guy with a gun. Like I, yes. I have a different memory. Like these feel like memories that I've had in a way. Right. Right. And so I fit myself in them. I mean, do you get that? Do you get people talking to you about like what they're seeing? And do you just go awesome? Great. That's not what I, you know. Right. Yeah. Actually, it should be said that I, I shouldn't say anything at all about the visual. I should just let people decide. For well, themselves it's, it's interesting to hear how you come up with them. But I mean, I have such a different experience of your work than you do. And I just wonder, and oh. it really is metaphorical. I mean, your work more than a lot of work is it invites your it's it's like a poem right and and right. it's wide open for interpretation i'm just wondering how you feel about that and are you interested in how people see it i mean they are oh, seeing, oh yes yeah, i, I so do cool. because it's how it's how this? you're connecting it, to it's the how world i'm connecting to the world and not only that i feel that it's my language and my language is being seen by a lot of people who does who can't speak English, but they see this yes, visual, yes. and 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 yeah, and cool. then it's here for a long period yeah. of time. I'm not making. How about this? I'm not making artwork for now. I'm work, making artwork for someone a hundred years from now or fifty years from now. I'll be gone, and it'll still be speaking. And it is poetry. It's visual poetry. It's my language and it's an it's an international language it's of this world now but it and very much so but that's so fascinating that, to sort of think of it as something you're leaving behind in yeah way. i'm a time traveler wow. i really do feel like i'm tra- well, you're a time traveler we're both time travelers we're making your how, how, how many you've been making images your whole life yeah yeah i've been looking at your stuff for yeah. years you you yeah. paint Things. There are things that I love the collaborative piece that I saw the other day. Oh, thanks. I, saw, I laughed at that and I said, We made that with a bunch of, well, there was like 10 of us made that in a workshop. Oh, so fun. God. I <laughs> hope that, you know, I mean, it, was, it just looked like you guys were jamming. Oh, we were. We were. Yeah, we were, were drinking and we were listening to music. And and for a lot of folks, that was the first time, because this is, you know, it's an Art to Life workshop, yeah. but they're, they were painting on something very big, you yeah. know, a lot of, a lot of people yeah. that are yeah. coming in, they're learning and they're yeah. working on smaller yeah. things. So what a cool thing. Cause I remember for me, when I painting bigger is kind of scary, but now you're doing it in a room full of people, you're probably drinking wine and, and we, you know, you kind of walk up, make a mark on this large painting and, and we all kind of evaluate it. Like, was that a powerful one or not? And you could completely tell. Right. And, you know, cheering everyone, everyone was super supportive, but it was fascinating to like, we're always by ourselves in our studio yes. and, you know, no one's going to cheer when you just nail it, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm looking at that picture there of this woman painting, uh, sweeping up all this piece of yeah. paper and you have that little piece of paper that's flying in front of yeah. her pant leg that's lifted off the ground and there's this little glint of contrast. Like that's an awesome paint mark. Like that oh. makes that painting. It's like it makes it like, oh, it's a glimpse. It's yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. But no one's here to like cheer or yawn. But yeah. in that setting, when we all made that, it was really cool because we got to do that. And it was, so it's just, there's all this memory of working with everyone. So I'm glad you, you like oh, that. No, we, I, we auctioned I them off. With that. Well, yeah. I, I, when I was in college, we used to do that. We oh, would really? go over to someone's house and instead of having wall, it would be a table. And we would sit on a table and we would do these. Uh, there would be like six of us there. And some of us might have been stoned. I don't know. It's it's the <laughs> 70s. And we would contribute and do a large, big piece. And we would just keep turning the drawing around and entertaining ourselves. It can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's a collaborative effort that brings people together and makes people feel more comfortable about making marks. I'd say that, you know, for the most part, I hate to bring in sex, but I do feel that painting is a a very sensuous and sexual kind of thing. I love seeing how paint goes on a surface. Mm. I can't explain how I just get so excited seeing new paint and just seeing it glisten and coming off a paintbrush, I find very, very sensuous. Yeah, just just the Tom Sawyer fence kind of idea where the act of painting, and this is the entrance for people who are trying to learn how to paint. It's something I focus on. You know, if someone's having a rough time, they don't like what they're making, just 
pretend like you're just trying to, you, there's a, a kindergartner next to you and just go, just have fun, you know, take this person, little kid and, and show them what fun it is to just put the paint on the surface. Because right. it really is, it is so sensual, it's so beautiful and it's just, I don't know, I think the reason it is so cool is because it's fun to watch things change. Yeah. You know, like go from like an ugly raw canvas thing and then you just butter on some beautiful cadmium red light. Oh. It's just, I think that's what uh, that's what's so intriguing about this. It's just this transformation that we get to stand in front of and, and change, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And change something, right. and change ourselves and then... This thing that you just made here is different than the last one, and there's this whole continuum. It's just this, even though the other cool thing about this is it drops you into the present. So you're in this present moment, which is amazing because you're not thinking about anything else. Right. I mean, you know, like, right, do you have that? The whole world could be going to hell, but you're just... It's just now. Yes. It's like yes. just now. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll give you one. I, I, how about this? And speaking about paint and there's a fellow student of mine who's who, who uh came i i was teaching at uh california college of the arts a couple of years ago i was a artist in residence so i invited some of my ex students that i hadn't seen in 25 years to come to this class and talk and they were professionals wow and that was wonderful and and i only I, I taught for a very short period of time, part time, five years. Uh, that was my limit back in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, and I stopped uh, because I didn't have time for for that. And so we move up the uh, the wheel, say twenty five years later, and here I am at this school, and I ask these fellow students that used to be students who are now professionals, gear. Yeah, What's it going on? You know, I mean, come on. I, we remember when you were teaching and you got you would come into class and you'd be so excited about paint. I said, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, you're still excited about oh, paint, yeah, I'm by still the way. excited about paint. Well, at this time, they, they said to me, and this was over at a dinner, are you still doing the broom paintings? And I said, oh, no, I've, I've moved on since the broom paintings. And so what they were talking about, I must share, I, I got giant pieces of butcher paper. And I would lay them on the floor, and I went to Sears and Roebuck, or I guess Sears, the hardware store, and I bought 10-gallon jugs of paint. I got a yellow, I got a blue, I got a red, <laughs> oh, yeah. I got a green, and I poured them all into little troughs, and I put the butcher paper on, on the floor, taped it off, and uh, I had a, a wonderful studio that I was in for about nine years, and I had 1,500 square feet, so I had great space, and I took a, a broom, and I would dunk it into the paint, and I would do these paintings on the floor. <laughs> and they were just marvelous. I just went, I wanted to go outside and get people off the street and go, check this out. <laughs> I've got red and green and yellow. Look at these things. I'm doing these giant cocoonings. And oh my God, I went nuts there for a while. It had totally nothing to do at all with anything I had in my life, except I was teaching myself about paint and the sensuousness. And the how about this? I think that making art is magical and there are some incredible sorcerers but it's so magical and there's so much surprise to it and it's funny but some people will look at my work and will say well geez garrett why do you have these water drips why is why do you have passages in the painting where you just let things go? Well, and I love that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, but that's I, what you're. Yeah, that's the connector. That yeah. is the connection. I love paint speaking to paint. I don't want to change control this whole control scene. that. Yeah, I really love that. Yeah, so no, I you do know, too. I, I, you know, I mine see, works the same way. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. When I see your stuff, I totally. It's it's sort of like kindred spirit. I totally get what you're doing, and I get excited. And you've done some major big pieces, you know, and I love your surfaces. And, and when you combine this, sort of letting the materials be themselves with the illusion of something realistic, it just takes it to another level. Like this is of the world, but then it's also plastic. It's just like flat right. minerals and pigment and materials. 
And, you know, you, you do that by, you know, when you brush through, you know, when you smear something. Talk about that a little. Like, oh. what happens when you, like, when I look at, you know, when I look at your work and you smeared it, for some reason, it feels like a memory, because this is, I think, how when we glimpse something or we remember something, we don't remember all of it. Your smeared portions make it, to me, feel like a memory. Is that is that what you're doing or why well, is that? Yes, I, I buy into that as well. I, I think that, you know, if there's anything I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it less obvious and just trying to make it a little subtler. I, I want it uh, to have a physical reaction to the person that yeah. views it to see that it's not made by a machine. There are mistakes, there are accidents, and these passages, you have to get down and say, thank you, Lord. Mm. I, I really do love seeing the blur of this arm. I don't want to see this arm totally worked out. I would love to see this arm as a suggestion. Right. And so I can add more elements from my own imagination to fill in yeah. those areas that I yeah. don't It's It's see. like the difference between a, a novel and a poem. I mean, a poem is so much more open and has there's more interpretation available. And, and I think that in a way, I think the reason, as I'm thinking about it, that we, that these feel like memories, I think that we take about, this is more like how we remember or when we see something, you know, you look up and you see somebody, you're not taking in all the information. There's just like the glint of the shoe on the, you know, right. like it's more real. This is more how we look at things. This is more realistic in a way. Right. Because right. these feel right. so real but they if everything was perfectly rendered that's not how we walk around and experience things i don't think but exactly i yeah. don't i don't want to spell everything out i'd yeah. like to have the viewer add things to it because i feel that i am sort of cursed by the fact that i am a representational painter and that was my background i can never let go of that that's who i am but if i can do anything i'll obscure and push that and make it a little harder for you, the visuals, you know, uh, uh, the person looking at this thing to wonder what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. To, uh, it, I think it's really easy to fill in all the areas and make it perfect. I think it's really hard to be someone like Bonard. It's very hard. I look at his work and I see awkwardnesses and that that are just you know, I go, God, I wouldn't paint that tablecloth like that and those things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those bottles. Right, but right. Damn, you do it so well. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, Jesus, yeah. you just, you know, you you threw everything out and you just listen to yourself and that is so psh, right yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so so what's coming up for you and kind of wrapping this up, I just, you know, your energy is so freaking contagious. I always feel after I talk to you, I just want to like go and work in my studio oh, but there like you go go yeah there no go. i mean yeah, it just yeah, yeah. Uh, but no it's so what's coming for you what's what are you excited about or scared of or what anything coming down Jeez, the pipe for I, you? I would say printmaking i started towards the uh oh, i guess the beginning of the pandemic i started getting into printmaking uh woodcuts oh. and i have a very 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 established uh printmaking a master printmaker chuck eckhart who has a whole studio printmaking studio set and he's not going to be any he's not getting any younger every day i put it off i need to do some okay. printmaking and i got into doing some woodcuts and i just said god i'd love to do some woodcuts i'd like to do some nice big ones and he's yeah. like come on over oh we'll do yeah yeah okay, what are you well, waiting for i'm gonna send him this podcast and that's gonna force you to, to go do there it you go. Yeah. oh yeah <laughs> chuck would just uh, say gary all right we got coffee on the on, right, the, on right. the stove. Come on over here. Awesome. We'll go. We'll do some printmaking together. Awesome. Well, listen. Thanks so much for just uh, letting me just drop in here. It's just always a friggin' well, uh, boost well, for me to talk to you, Nick. It's a pleasure. I tell you, if there's anyone you're getting out the message, and you're an ambassador for people who make images that are two thousand years old, and 
people who want to do things like this, I can only, you know, hope and and that they would be inspired by yeah. your telecasts and will continue on. Because yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just, important, especially in our day and age. Totally. Just to see the journey of everybody and just to hear what people are making and how they're making it, the, the, the idea that this is it's available and it's so yeah. different for everybody and that's that's what's super cool and that's what's so great about seeing what you're doing and how you're doing it it's just it's amazing so thank you you're welcome hey thanks for listening to the art to life show if you enjoyed the podcast please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on instagram at art to life underscore world the recording of this and all episodes along with a place to leave comments see additional photos and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning, I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.